Mosquitoes have been around at least 100 million years, and with them comes disease. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people die from malaria, Zika, and dengue fever. But this could all change overnight. Right now, new genetic weapons are being tested that implant a genetic kill switch and wipe out an entire unwanted mosquito species. 100 million years on Earth, and then suddenly gone. Would the world be a better place without them? There's one thing we know for sure. The future will be a wild, wild world where human impulses reshape entire ecosystems. The future of our civilization will primarily depend on the technologies that we choose to invent and whether, when, and how to use them. Changing an organism's biology and turning it against itself reflects a kind of hubris on the part of humans. I'm Cody Sheehy, your host. I'm also the director of the documentary, Make People Better. This film tells the story of how a Chinese scientist secretly created the world's first genetically engineered babies. And I'm your co-host, Samira Kiani, a medical doctor, genetic engineer, and co-producer of the film. You're listening to the Make People Better podcast brought to you by the Random Good Foundation, where we introduce you to the greatest minds and most interesting people at the cusp of a genetic engineering revolution that is transforming science fiction into science fact. In this episode, we are interested in exploring how genetic science is providing us with immensely powerful tools that can modify the genetics of an entire species. We'll sit down for a mind-bending hour with Dr. Kevin Esfalt of MIT. He's the director of the Sculpting Evolution Lab. We'll also get a sobering perspective from Jim Collins, an evolutionary ecologist at Arizona State University. But first, a word from our sponsors. The Make People Better podcast is brought to you by the Random Good Foundation. Modern humans often think of the natural world as a wilderness, a pristine cathedral of nature that exists out there somewhere outside of our cities and agricultural areas, outside of us. The modern reality is that almost all ecosystems have been shaped and reshaped by humans for thousands of years. A defining characteristic of humanity has been our ability to modify the natural world to be better suited to us. The agricultural and industrial revolutions have ushered in a new era where we completely reshape the Earth's land surfaces into monoculture crops and vast urban areas. Today, 35% of all mammal biomass is human. Only 5% of the biomass are wild animals. The remaining 60%, almost two thirds of all mammal biomass are the farm animals that we like to eat. Cows, pigs, sheep. Animals whose genetics we have already been shaping through hundreds of years of selective breeding. So we are managing the world in a very big way. Mosquitoes too. For decades, rich nations have been spraying chemical pesticides that have been pretty successful at knocking them out. Many people feel that it's natural for humans to just continue on doing what we do. In this case, why not use genetic tools to change insects, plants, coral, to Well, whatever we want, really. Perhaps a better way to think about this is that we are switching to a different scale in how we manage the biosphere of the Earth. From managing at the scale of things we can see, like cutting a forest or breeding two animals together, to now taking ownership of ecosystems at a genetic level, a level invisible to the human eye 
a level that is really hard to understand or appreciate or even see the consequences of what we do because it is really a different plane of existence, a place that is completely alien to us. If we zoom down to the scale of genetics, a new world emerges, one that underpins all life on Earth. All kinds of important boundaries at the biggest scale are now going to disappear. An individual animal has now become an ecosystem of life, like a coral reef or a mountain range. For example, the human body contains trillions of microorganisms, outnumbering human cells by 10 to 1. Management of nature at the genetic level will have rewards and consequences we have barely even begun to understand. Mosquitoes have long plagued humans with malaria. What if we could drive dangerous varieties to extinction? Agricultural pests plague our crops. What if we could remove them without pesticides? Both of these examples are already being tested with a new approach called gene drives. It's hard to imagine that we now have the power to just completely reshape nature from our lab stools. I mean, we're sitting in an air-conditioned lab somewhere. We don't have to be out in the field tearing out brush with tractors or cutting down trees. I know. It's incredible. And I've never liked mosquitoes personally, to be completely honest. <laughs> but I do find them fascinating. I had the opportunity one time to film mosquitoes in extreme close-up when they were biting into a human and they were sucking the blood out of the human. And then in the abdomen, you could see the blood compressing there. And then they were squirting liquid out the back so that they could pack in more human blood cells. Mosquitoes, they're kind of gross, but they're also kind of cool. But I think they're going to end up on a list of all the, the species that we're going to just eliminate. And, you know, there are a lot of other ones, too. I mean, just think of all the agricultural crops we have that are plagued by little pests. Those are going to end up on this list, too. And in fact, when you think of all the ideas that 8 billion humans are going to have, this might end up being a really long list of species that we want to modify. But first, Samara, what, what is a gene drive? What are we talking about? Gene drives are bits of engineered genetic codes that would be inserted into an organism, let's say a mosquito in a lab, and then released into the wild. The code, for example a piece of information to drive male sex in the mosquito will quickly spread throughout the entire mosquito species and cause all new mosquitoes to be born male. Too many males, the species will collapse. This would work because the gene drive modifies certain genes so that they don't follow the typical rules of heredity. Gene drives dramatically increase the likelihood that a particular suite of genes will be passed on to the next generation, allowing the genes to rapidly spread through a population and overwrite natural selection. Uh, Oxitec, a firm based in the UK, they developed something for mosquitoes that carry Zika, dengue fever, yellow fever. And they've been field testing this in Brazil, Panama, Cayman Islands, in Malaysia, and now they're working with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District and plan on releasing them in Florida in six different locations. Wow. <laughs> From the experiments that I think some of the scientists have done recently, we see that local people who live in the area um, obviously have a lot of questions and, you know. What kinds of concerns are people raising about gene drives? Uh, that, you know, over time and over generation after generation, they can mutate or they can regain new functionality, something that we can't predict. There could be unintended consequences, things we just don't understand. <laughs> I mean, this is a good time to really talk about Kevin Esfeldt and the latest experiment that he's been really looking into is releasing genetically altered mice, but to do it on Nantucket Island. With that, let's bring in Kevin Esfeldt. My name is Kevin Esfeldt. 
I'm an assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab, where I run the Sculpting Evolution Group. So my group is called Sculpting Evolution because we not only work to sculpt the evolution of living things, learning how evolution in its endless creativity managed to create the wondrous organisms all around us, but we're also interested in the evolution of technology and how we can sculpt the evolution of technology in ways that are more beneficial for both humans and the many organisms that we share our planet with. The future of our civilization will primarily depend on the technologies that we choose to invent and our wisdom in determining whether, when, and how to use them. So we will be discussing CRISPR in this episode. Can you tell us what that is? How is it connected to gene drives? So I played a very minor role in helping to develop CRISPR genome editing, which is a molecular scalpel that allows us to cut and therefore edit just about any DNA sequence in any genome. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. What if we could program the organism to do that on its own? What if we could make genome editing recursive, make it happen every generation? To do that, we might encode not just the change we want to make, but the CRISPR genome editing system programmed to make that change. That way, our engineered organism would be able to pass that alteration onto its offspring, but in the reproductive cells of those offspring, genome editing would happen again. CRISPR would turn on, it would cut the original wild version inherited from the other parent and convert it over to the edited version. That means that the edited organism would then have two copies of the altered gene and consequently would be guaranteed to pass it on to all of its offspring. And I thought this would be a true fitness advantage this is what's called a gene drive system. Gene drive is this phenomenon when a genetic element will spread in a population even if it doesn't help the organism reproduce. And it does it by distorting the odds of inheritance in its favor. And one example of a project that we've been working on is called Mice Against Ticks. And the idea is most ticks, ones that will give you nasty diseases like Lyme, aren't actually born infected. They get the Lyme disease pathogen when they bite an infected mouse. So our idea was, what if we immunize the mice in a way that was heritable, so it would be passed down to future generations of mice, so that they couldn't get the Lyme disease pathogen anymore? Then they wouldn't be able to pass it to ticks, and then the ticks wouldn't pass it to children. So as you are developing the gene drive concept, which has massive power, did it ever come up that you might want to not develop it? not tell anyone? When you think of a, a new technology, what should you do as a scientist? If you choose not to tell anyone, then you forfeit the chance to do good with it. You forfeit all of the potential benefits. If you choose to tell someone and the technology is eventually developed, then you're morally responsible for all of the consequences. So the question is, is this something that could be dangerous? Could it be misused? And so I thought about this very carefully before I told anyone and concluded that the answer was probably not. And the reason is, in principle, any change that one CRISPR system makes can be overwritten by another CRISPR-based gene drive. Now, to many people, this sounds extremely risky, right? Because you're trusting the same technology that potentially caused the problem to fix it. But on the other hand, if it was good enough to spread in a population to solve the problem, then it's good enough to spread in a population to undo that, what we call an immunizing reversal drive. So we decided that this technology didn't pose a major biosecurity risk. And so it was OK to share it with a broader group. And the consensus was that we should tell the world that this was possible before we actually tested it in the lab. Now, that's not normally how science is done. Normally, you show that it works before you bother to tell the world. But this was CRISPR. It would not be reckless of us to tell the world that this was almost certainly going to be possible. And the reason was we wanted to set a precedent for transparency and telling the world about what you plan to do before you actually do it. And again, this is not how science is normally done. So part of the way that we go about these projects, Mice Against Ticks went to the community at the very beginning 
and said, are you interested in this as a potential solution, given that it would involve releasing a couple hundred thousand genetically engineered mice onto your island? Is that something you might want? And somewhat surprisingly, they said, yes, we're very interested. We're not, of course, convinced that we want to go ahead and do it, but we're certainly interested enough that we would like you to explore developing these mice. And we've done it under a very community-guided way, setting up a steering committee, because we don't know everything. We can't know everything in these complex systems. So we have to do as much as we can to invite concerns and criticism, especially from skeptics. Let's say that a community decides that they don't want to proceed. What stops a scientist from just doing it anyway? I mean, get the results and then present their findings publicly afterward. My assertion is that the ordinary scientist is doing things with far too much secrecy. Science evolved in a time when we could be confident that the typical discovery would improve the world. And as long as the net discovery is positive, that's a perfectly safe strategy. The problem is, as the power of technology increases, eventually, if something goes wrong, it may go wrong badly enough that we may not be able to recover from it. That is, once a system is working with technologies that are sufficiently powerful and accessible to enough people, we can no longer afford to make mistakes. The way it's going to affect the environment is going to depend almost entirely on our early stage research decisions. What technology are we going to develop to alter the ecosystem? And how are we going to about go about doing it? There's lots of different ways that we could do it, depending on the nature of the problem we want to solve. And the values of the people who might live there. But if we do that in a closeted fashion, we're denying you a voice in which of those possibilities will come to pass. And that's a problem because you can't opt out of the effects. If your community decides to go ahead with it, even if it's put to a vote and you lose the vote, you will be affected anyway. You can't opt out. And that's why this kind of technology, which we call eco-technologies, is more like civic governance than it is traditional technology development and research, because it will affect everyone in ways they won't be able to opt out of. So we felt pretty strongly that this is a technology that must be developed in the open from the very beginning. In my field, we're already dealing with the legacy of the controversy over GMOs, because there is a technology that was developed not for the highest priority applications with benefits obvious to everyone, not in a nonprofit manner, in fact, by for-profit corporations whose business practices were criticized for many other reasons, and in ways that encouraged the sales of their other products, including additional herbicides. More chemicals on people's food, and then introducing that into the food supply in a way that didn't really offer the opportunity for much of a public discussion of it until it was already done, that's a great way to get a backlash to your technology. And now, anyone who is even remotely opposed to anything that we're doing with any kind of genome editing can just say, oh, you're just another arm of Monsanto. Doesn't matter that we're not. It's a pretty effective attack line. And we have to deal with that every single day. I mean, in some cases, society has a feeling that it's being overwhelmed by technologies. Let's say a gene drive is released and then it's later determined to be a mistake. What do we do then? We don't have to affect the whole species. A primary area of my group's research is on ways of building systems that either don't require a drive at all or have a drive system that is what we call self-exhausting. So we build these daisy drive systems that involve multiple genetic elements linked together in a daisy chain. Each one causes the next one to be preferentially inherited but the one on the end of the chain has no advantage, so it's lost like a normal gene. And then once it's gone, then the next one loses its advantage, and so it's lost. And so you lose one link in the chain after another. They're like genetic fuel, and once they're all used up, it stops. Can you envision a future yourself, personally, where we're using gene drives widely and safely? There are very few applications suitable for the self-propagating drive system that will affect the entire species. Right now, I can see maybe three hitting the primary vectors of malaria in African mosquitoes. That is something where if all the African nations can agree they want to do that, 
I think there is overwhelming evidence suggesting that they should. We don't think those mosquitoes interact with any other species, but there's a lot of ecology going on right now trying to find out for sure. Those are all fascinating um, concepts. Of course, I think by now everyone knows that I always believe that nature will outthink us. <laughs> um, the, the movie Jurassic Park always comes to mind. You know, nature finds a way. Even the best engineered dinosaur have a flaw somewhere or something. Actually, let's cut to a scene from Jurassic Park to make that point. <laughs> Gee, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here um, staggers me. Well, thank you, Dr. Malcolm, but I think things are a little bit different than you and I had feared. Yeah, yeah I know. They're a lot worse. Now, wait a second. Now, we haven't even... Seen the part no, 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 don't let him talk. There's no reason. No, no, I want to hear every viewpoint. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Don't you see the danger, uh, John, inherent uh, in what you're doing here? Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. It's hardly appropriate to start hurling it's generalizations. Just, uh, if I may, um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. We don't know. As human beings, we don't know exactly the the, the rule and the, the the laws of how nature functions to be able to outpower that. We can imagine things, and yes, some of those imaginations are based on the scientific fact and tools that we have, and we might push those imagination further and further, further and further, as as these tools are developed. But I am a strong believer that you know. Um, we we are like childs playing w w in in a backyard, knowing that we conquered the the world. But it, in reality, the world is much bigger than us. And I guess, and I believe, universe and nature are is much bigger than us. That is an amazing analogy. So you create a visual image of kids running around playing king and queen in the backyard, and in their minds, they're king and queen. But in reality. They're not king and queen. It's just in their minds. Exactly. And that's what scientists are doing. They're running around thinking they have this power and telling everyone they have the power. But the reality is they may not have the power. But they might have the power. Let's say that you give those kids running around in the backyard a knife or a gun. That could be, could create an accident that has nothing to do with the story that they're telling about their kingdom. And all of a sudden, reality could come crashing in in a horrible way. Exactly. And knowing that's where we kind of say knowing our limitation and what we can and cannot achieve is very important. And I believe in scientists like Kevin, uh, whom we listened to just now, identify that maybe in some way or the other, they might be playing with fire. They might be those kids playing with a sword. At least, I mean, they, they take necessary and um, I think thoughtful steps to reflect upon different dimensions of what they are doing. And I admire that. What I heard from Kevin, though, is that he's really interested in speeding science up. It is very thoughtful, yes, but it's not thoughtfully slow down. It's thoughtfully get more information. So it's so even though he is cautious and thoughtful, his solution is to go faster, not slower. But he did admit that this technology is so cheap and easy that once they're done developing it, almost anyone can do it. But he claimed that any gene drive could be overridden by another CRISPR edit. So you can do a reversal drive so we can fix the problem. And to me, this is starting to sound really, really complicated. <laughs> I mean, we would need some kind of like monitoring of all the DNA of all the species out there, I guess. And like, is it really practical to be managing on this level? You know, first of all, as you said, you have to be able to track every single organism that is born from that species that is released. Let's say it's a mosquito. How are you going to track every single mosquito that is, you know, born over the time? And the other thing is that unless we make tremendous advances on the CRISPR technology or the technologies like CRISPR that come after that, that they are super efficient, 100% efficient or so. The tools that we have currently is not yet efficient to be able to deliver a 100% result. 
right? So even if you can reverse some of the gene drives, you, your efficiency is not 100%. So you will have escapes or escapees. I don't know how you call it. Um, and maybe some level of risk is acceptable. As long as you decrease the critical mass, that, that would be okay. That's a tough question to answer. Many experts from ecology are, are really worried about gene drives because they feel like our management of the environment up until now has a really dismal track record. And in their opinion, having amazingly powerful new technologies like gene drives is not changing the fundamental equation. It's just that the consequences will be very, very big this time. And I think Jim Collins probably falls into that camp. So I think it's a good time to talk to Jim Collins, who is my former colleague at Arizona State University. Jim Collins has studied this field for, for many years as an evolutionary ecologist. Cody, you remember we sat down with him in his laboratory. So you may hear uh, some of his research scientists uh, busy in the background. I'm uh, Professor James Collins. I'm a Virginia M. Ullman Professor of Natural History and the Environment here at Arizona State University. How long have you been at Arizona State University? 42 years, and I, I, but I spent um, five years on detail to the National Science Foundation. So I worked there for five years, first as a program officer and population biology program director, and four years as director of biological sciences. So, what drew you to uh, the research into gene drives? Kevin Esvelt and George Church first presented their ideas. This was, the meeting was at MIT, right. about 20 of us around the table. And he laid out, Kevin did, laid out the um, theory associated with the application of gene drives, changing an organism's biology and turning it against itself. I was sitting at the table and heard this presentation and said, wow, this is pretty powerful. So we took that on and uh, started in about 2014 on what eventually became the report on gene drives in our future. In your professional opinion, where do you think the United States stand in relationship to other countries? Uh, in the United States, I believe we stand in a situation where we have um, more regulations in place and stronger regulatory authority in place, even if it's just a moral argument. In other countries, it does seem to me it's a bit more of a laissez-faire approach. And if the scientist is capable of doing the research and moving in that direction, then he or she will move in that direction within the laboratory. So if you are in charge of health in sub-Saharan Africa, and I said I can put in your hands the technology to eliminate the vector responsible for malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, would you use it? And what are the arguments for and against using it? Um, that's a pretty tough call. That's a pretty tough call. Personally, I would argue that the science should move in the direction of moving those populations to lower numbers as opposed to extinction, because it puts us in a very tough position ethically to say, on one hand, which I do, argue for the conservation of the Earth's biodiversity. And at the same time, I'm going to pick a few species and say, I'm willing to drive them to extinction. Uh, what about the biohacking community, the do-it-yourself DIY community? Is there any regulation that can control that community? It's relatively easy to do. It's relatively inexpensive to do from the point of view of DIY individuals, you're probably always gonna have a group of actors who, regardless of how you structure things, they're just gonna to wanna to do that. They're not interested in regulations. There are some very nasty downsides to what could happen under those sort of circumstances. I really would like to know more about your idea and opinion on the ethical considerations and reservations about gene drives? 
Sure, sure. So the first thing to say is that the science still needs some, some distance to go in terms of being improved. But, but let's take it as given that that technology becomes so well developed that we take it for granted. We can manipulate nature at our will at what would really be unprecedented levels, potentially with a real ease, a real ease. Releasing a few organisms, manipulated in a certain way, and then sit back. A willingness to reach into ecosystems in a way that reflects a kind of hubris on the part of humans that we can manipulate these immensely complex systems. We have many examples, too many examples, where we have reached into systems and it hasn't worked out nearly as well as we thought it was going to work out. Now, with all that said, I don't see a strong division between humans over here and all other, quote, nature, unquote, over there. I believe it's healthier to see us as part of the system. Especially in Europe, global change. My grandchildren will spend a significant part of their future thinking about how to adapt to a changing planet. The possibility of using technologies to facilitate the evolution of organisms, that's going to go along incrementally and it's going to be what it's going to be. If you feel you can do that, and do that, and do that, at some point, it'll only get you in trouble, and therefore, you have to have some way to stop. Something has to stop it. Is that okay? We seem to wander off task. <laughs> I always like to listen to Jim Collins because he brings in a lot of perspective into different ways we can actually engineer these with more, you know, ethical and regulatory oversights. Yeah, he's a perfect example of a scientist who studies the complexity of nature rather than how we would want to control it. And that kind of research has led him to have a deep sense of respect and humility in front of nature, I believe, um, which is comforting to know that those people are also involved in this field. Uh, and I'm really glad that he is, he is there to bring that wisdom to the rest of the community, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. In the time since we met with Kevin Esfeld and Jim Collins, the field of gene drives continues to be debated, and that list of proposed ideas of things we might want to do, it is continuing to grow. And scientists are still working hard to perfect the technology, and testing continues in various locations around the world. Join us for the next episode, where we focus on bioterrorism. Many security experts believe that, as cheap, and easy-to-use gene editing tech proliferates, the occurrence of international release of viruses like smallpox or even synthetic viruses are likely candidates for causing the next pandemic. Please support this podcast by sharing it and leave us a review. We would also love to add your voice to this conversation. We'll be hosting a live discussion around this topic and you're invited to join. So check out the show notes for details. The Make People Better podcast is brought to you by the Random Good Foundation. Thanks, and we'll talk with you again soon.